so with this level, this was one that kind of grew out of the work I was doing on the other levels kind of around it. Um, it's an example of, of a level that kind of the mechanics are there mainly because I just liked the way they interacted with each other. So there's a lot of really interesting overlapping kind of um, movements that you're doing in this environment. Going back on yourself, um, using you know, changing ability midair, uh, water not being a threat because the water, all the water in this level is obviously surrounded in that blue trigger zone. It means that water becomes a, a buoyant interaction. You actually have to use the buoyancy, uh, I believe, for the first time in the game in order to uh, hit the switch on the right. So there's a really kind of interesting interaction that takes place here that I, I, I wanted to play with, and I think kind of uh, is quite fun. So Team Jump, <laughs> I love Team Jump. Team Jump, the main purpose of Team Jump was to bring a little bit more humour into the game. I really wanted to um, have a group of characters who were a bit silly, um, a bit a bit stupid, to be honest, <laughs> and a bit and a bit fun. The other interesting thing with Team, team Jump is Team Jump were actually how long this long game time. originally was envisaged. When I first started thinking about these mechanics like many, many years ago, I um I imagined kind of a group of characters all the same that you could basically kind of stack up and make kind of um I don't know the word for it but those kind of um, gymnast uh, poses where you stack up a bunch of people on on at the same time I wanted to do that kind of thing with characters in the game and it, it kind of in the context of the game I was thinking about it didn't really work but in this context it felt like actually adding a bunch of characters who were all essentially identical um and then getting the player to build them into towers or get them to help each other out became really interesting and became something that was a different style of gameplay. The other characters, because they're all so unique, you kind of think of them as unique entities and use them as such. Whereas with these, because they're all the same, um, I kind of hoped that they would be seen as one unit and it became a case of almost having a transforming shape character in the game. And I'm a massive Transformers geek, so, <laughs> so that was fun. But uh, yeah, I'm 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 kind of I, I feel there's more puzzles to be done with Team Jump. I might I might have to revisit them one day.
thought as one, they acted as one. This is another one of my favorite levels, actually. Um, there's a few things going on here that I just think are really cool. The main one, obviously, is the, there's current to the water. Um, this, I'm, I had this, I programmed this into water the, the moment I made water. It was very easy. It was actually easier to make the water have a current to it and actually kind of pull the player across than it was to make you know, the water buoyant. So they always had a movement to them, but I never really worked out a puzzle that kind of suited it, always felt frustrating, or if you played with it, it felt like it was kind of helping you win by default. Um, and this was a fun level to make because I got to use that current in, in an interesting way. So there's points where that current uh, can be dangerous because it can knock you into things that hurt you. Um, but the bit that I really love in this level, um, and it's something that I had to tweak things a little bit for, was there's a moment, there are moments where in order to win, you have to intentionally sink into the water but because the water has a currency of it, uh, has a has a, a current going through it, you're then swept into a trigger zone, which saves you, um, kind of an underwater um, uh, save, which is something that doesn't exist in the rest of the game. I really worry that players wouldn't get it and they would kind of avoid it because they'd see it as dangerous. But by doing that, it just kind of just breaks the mechanics in a really charming way that you kind of have to sacrifice your, your characters in order to. By default, be saved by be saved by that um, by that by that secondary uh, trigger zone, and I'm, I'm just really chuffed with it. It came together. It felt really good. It was it was hard. I had to fiddle with some code to make it work, but it's a really nice moment. That I'm I'm really chuffed with, um, and, and then that's it really. The, the, there's so much going on in this level. It's just a nice. It's a very Thomas was alone level, and I'm I'm really chuffed with it. <laughs> This is a level, this is something, that a mechanic that I kind of really wanted to bring in, which is the the idea of avoiding um, trigger zones. The trigger zones become dangerous, um, just in and of themselves. So here you have, like, right at the top there at the end, you have those, um, those blank trigger zones, um, which are intersecting with the water as you swim across. You have to avoid those in order to not turn away from being buoyant and sink. You have to kind of avoid those... And it was really interesting to take something that the player has up to this point uh, used, basically has empowered them, and then to make that a hazard that they have to avoid. Um, and that's something that can only really be achieved once the players 
you know getting the system they've they've been through enough challenges with it. they understand how these trigger zones operate um you can start introducing these kind of abstract um repurposing i guess of of the existing mechanics so that's it works really nicely i think um yeah it's fun <laughs> and it becomes a little bit frogger which is quite charming <laughs> should apologize um, I've just been reminded that the things I've been referring to for the entirety of this commentary as trigger zones are in fact shifters um, it's fine I wrote the script but I forgot the words <laughs> so I've been reminded of that so I will now endeavor to call them shifters um, I apologize if I've been talking nonsense I've probably been talking nonsense well done to you by the way for, for staying with me this long um, a lot of people will have listened to the first few levels had a good time um, and then kind of moved on with their day. But you've really stuck it out, and, and that makes you special. And I, I appreciate that. Okay, so this environment. <laughs> uh, this environment is, is um, all about that shifting back and forth, um, but in a really kind of frequent way. It's kind of hopefully kind of a constant bounce back and forth. This was where I started to give in to my love of uh, V. 
um, and wanted to the the indie game where you switch gravity. This is the, the next few levels are kind of owed to that. Um, anti gravity, uh, having anti gravity in the game as well as blanks makes for some really interesting puzzles because you actually have the alternation uh, that, that is in the game. The um, it's not player controlled in that way, uh, but it means you can do some really interesting kind of spatial puzzles. Uh, this is a very uh, slow inter introduction. The, the biggest thing here was to introduce anti gravity in a way that didn't um, that didn't confuse the player and that they didn't have to make decisions too quickly. So every choice you make here has a delay on it. There's no um, shifters that switch you from blank to anti gravity immediately. Um, you have always have a chance to decide on your tactic and to adjust accordingly. Um, I get to the fast stuff in a moment. is that moment um this is <laughs> this is the bit where you kind of get stuck in an alternation loop um uh, this was from the moment i knew i was going to have the shifters at the end of the game this was kind of the first level that came to mind um mainly because it's ripped off from b <laughs> um this idea of of, a, of be, being forced to loop back and forth mine's a lot nicer i don't kill you as much um because you know i don't i didn't want to um, and yeah, you kind of progress these characters through. What's really interesting here is is playing with the different distances these characters travel because of their uh, their their differences in in mass. They kind of each have a different way of interacting. So as you can see there, uh, Joe and Sam move a lot more than Gray does, um, and that's and that's cool because that means that you can have a lot of fun with the space. And as the blocks progress, you have um, different routes. It would surprise me massively if every player plays through this. Um, by taking the characters the same path, it's it, you. You've got a lot of options there, and I like the fact that you're gonna find different ways through the space with each of the different characters, and probably different ways than everyone else who's played it. Uh, so, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those kind of freer puzzles that I, I quite like. <laughs> So I said before that <laughs> the game is at its best when you have two or maybe three characters on screen at the same time. Uh, this level has, I believe, nine characters, or is it eight? It might be eight. I think it's eight. I'll tell you why I think it's nine. It's because it was nine, um, or ten, one of the two. <laughs> because, but I actually removed one of the team jump. That was mainly because on um, a computer keyboard the numbers didn't go high enough that I could make um, have a game which had that many characters in. I didn't really consider it, but I, I, I had to had to go without one of the Team Jump members, which would be fine if there wasn't a piece of dialogue in this level specifically referencing the fact that there are five members in Team Jump. Um, most people don't notice it unless I point it out. Um, uh, so, yeah, hopefully I got away with it until you saw this. If you did get it, well done. You're very clever. Um, please don't tell anyone. It'll be our little secret. Um, the environment is actually this is probably the longest level in the game. This is this is one that most people take a good five to ten minutes to work their way through. Um, it's kind of frustrating as a result. I would honestly, if I were to do it over, I would probably break this into several different levels and kind of allow you to go through each of these puzzles separately. Um, but I didn't. Uh, so this is this is the level. It's it's quite long. Enjoy it.
So this level's all about um, annoying the player. <laughs> so that, that really here, the shifters are placed in such a way that basically every shifter in this in this map is there to kill you. Um, so you have to be very careful about where you tread, about um, getting characters past uh, difficult shifters that would cause them problems, um, and that becomes the focus for the player is kind of avoiding shifters, but more importantly. Um, just, just, just playing in a way that's intelligently avoiding them so that you can get through the level. Um, I really like this level, and it was horrible before checkpoints. With checkpoints, it's actually, I think, one of the more interesting levels because you, you progress through it, you get a few setbacks, but you carry on. Um, and yeah, it's cool. I like it. trying to save his friends. Thank you. 
when I said uh, there was kind of there are a few levels that came to mind when I added the anti gravity shifters to the game. Um, the last one was the, the the obvious kind of the V one, um, but this was the other one was the idea of a falling um, a falling room where we get bands of uh, anti gravity and blanks kind of passing forth uh, passing through the passing through the environment, which means that you're constantly alternating. All of your characters just alternate every few seconds between the two states. And I liked that. I liked the idea of playing around with the player's kind of environment and their expectations and, and making it so that what is quite a straightforward map, if you were just in one of these states, becomes an interesting challenge because you have to kind of factor in the, the different options. This is also, um, just being a bit arrogant for a little while, this is a, a motif I use in quite a few games. Um, so a lot of games I've worked on have included a bit where a small box falls through a, um, through a tunnel. I, I don't know why, I just like that the shape of that. So for example, um, the last boss fight of um, Invincible Tiger, which was a, an XBLA game I worked on, that takes place in a very very similar environment it's a it's a thing i try and get into as many games as i can because i just think it's aesthetically interesting um and feels dramatic This is the penultimate level of the game, um, and yeah, the the real thing here, I had to have the last kind of puzzle of the game. I didn't want to do that in the very last level of the game because I wanted the last level of the game to really just kind of tie up the story and be an experience kind of focus level rather than a puzzle. Uh, so this was the this was the environment where I really wanted to play play with the puzzle and play with those interactions and the idea of the kind of the, I called them during development I think I called these the, the the brush elevators or something where basically you have a different shifter of each type that's been introduced minus the anti-gravity for obvious reasons there's no proof um, <laughs> and and you get you, you can basically choose which character you want to go into which of those shifters to progress through and while there's a bit of wiggle room, there is really only kind of one solution. There's, there's a few different kind of tweaks you can use character A or character B to do the same job. But I liked that. I liked the idea of one last puzzle, which the player hopefully kind of would have to fiddle with and have to work out with uh, just before I get to a kind of final story moment.
This is it. This is the last level of the game. Um, this is the moment that the whole story has been leading up to. You've got two characters with uh, the separate shifter abilities. I don't play with them uh, too much within the, the bulk of the level. Um, I wanted you to use these two characters in an interesting way together to progress through because obviously that's what the, the whole game has been about. And this to me really is, is the moment where everything hopefully comes together. We've got a nice minimalist environment which has some cool effects work, which I'm, I'm, I'm chuffed with and I think works. We've got that incredible last piece of music that David did, which I, I genuinely think is just one of the most moving pieces of video game music I've ever heard. Um, with this one actually, all that clever procedural stuff that, <laughs> that I mentioned earlier, we didn't do that on this one. This one needed to be controlled by David. This had to have exactly the progression that he had in mind and that leads to a, a, a precision to the way that it's been, it's been put together and arranged. Um, and it feels epic. And then Danny comes in, Danny's performance brings it up as well. This is the kind of the crescendo of the game and it's a perfect illustration of, of why the collaboration was so important. The, the, fr the number of different people who put work into this game. Um, and I, know, I, I think it works. I think it works as a result of that. It's something I'm, I'm a little mindful in our little chats that we've been having as you play this game um, that I maybe haven't mentioned those guys enough. This is this is a game that could not possibly exist without the collaboration of, of specifically David and Danny and what they bring to the storytelling and the environment of this game. Um, so yeah, they're pretty awesome. Uh, this level uh, ends with obviously that final rise and. And yeah, I've had a few comments. People um, feel the ending maybe isn't quite as clear as it could be. Um, I will tell you now what I think the ending means. Um, to my mind, these two characters uh, find an escape. They exit the computer. They, um, they, they become fully aware. Well, they are fully aware, but they become uh, they come out into the real world. What happens next? Um, well, that depends. I don't know yet. I've got some ideas. I've got some thoughts on what happens next, but essentially every sci-fi movie you ever watch with an ai in happens next um this is this is their emergence this is these are the first precursor ais to succeed and that's my reading of the ending but your reading might might differ and that's absolutely cool um and i like reading some of the theories online okay um this is me i'm done um i've enjoyed our time together um thank you uh, so much thank you so much for buying the game that was very nice of you um, thank you very much for finishing the game. That was that was also very nice of you, even with all those stair bits. And thank you very, very much for listening to this, listening to my voice, listening to me in this recording studio, um, trying to say stuff that's vaguely interesting about the game. I hope I hope that succeeded. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's really cool of you to to join me. If you'd like to hear more of my ramblings, uh, please uh, follow me on Twitter. It's at Mike Bithel. And yeah. I, I look forward to saying hello to you. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers.